What's up everyone, welcome back to Let's Play Demon Souls. So since we now have the old hero's soul, I was about to call him the old monk, that's a different boss. Along with the Storm King's soul, we can forge a few new weapons. So why don't we go ahead and do that? Okay, so Ed has nothing new to say to us. So yeah, short sword plus eight, plus the old Euro's soul, not the old monk's soul, makes the large sword of searching. I think I already described that. Let's just go ahead and make it. It is the weapon that the old hero uses, and its unique characteristic is that it increases your item drop rate. Well done. So ideally, that pure black world tendency in a high luck stat will yield better drop rates for rare stones, like the pure blade stone I was talking about. <clears throat> and then claws plus eight. Plus, the Storm King Soul makes the Morium Blade, which I described at length already. Also, read this description real quick. These beasts take pleasure in the wielder's peril, and in these situations, the blade's attack power is greatly increased. So basically, everything I've been saying about them, the, uh, the Storm Beasts, is right. Also, it's made from their bone marrow, apparently. So everything I've been saying about them is completely correct that they're basically sadistic little flying assholes. I hate them. I hate them so much. Also, this is what the Large Sword of Searching looks like. It's a pretty ridiculous weapon, especially in the hands of a tiny little hummin. So, cutting ahead here. This is... Uh, I believe I already showed off the shortcut. This is, this is a very dangerous way to approach the shortcut. So, why are we back here in... Uh, World 2-2. Well, we're gonna do the Black Phantom Skurver fight, which only shows up in Pure Black World Tendency. This is where Skurver normally is. And here is where he actually is. So what I cut there off camera was me dying uh, seven times in a row and using... Was it six or seven? A bunch of times in a row and using a bunch of Stones of Ephemeral Eyes in order to get body form back. That's... Like I've been saying all along, the easiest way to attain pure black world tendency in any world. Especially, it's especially easy if the world has an easily, quickly accessible pitfall that you can just suicide off of over and over again. Now, the one thing that you have to pay attention to when you're farming uh, pure black world tendency, farming is a weird way to phrase it, but it is kind of what you're doing, is that... The graphic in the upper right doesn't always immediately reflect your current world tendency status. So you usually have to reload or zone out to the Nexus and zone back in for the graphic to properly reflect that. And that also goes for the menu. Also, have I mentioned that Skurver fucking hurts? He hurts bad. That was serious damage. I. I'm pretty sure I blocked that fireball, and it still did all that damage through the block of a fire-resistant shield. Nuts. Ludicrous. Bonkers. Bananas. Synonyms for crazy. So all of his attacks are fire-based. Yee. That was a little too close for comfort, given how much damage the last one did. Uh, the reason his health is ticking down five points every... Looks like every second or so? Every half second, maybe? is because I used the Poison Cloud ability on him. I'm not gonna, obviously I'm not gonna cheese the fight out. Mo almost every single uh, NPC and every single Black Phantom can be cheesed out just by casting Poison Cloud and walking away. Because Poison Cloud usually won't aggro uh, an NPC. So you can get just barely close enough to where they won't come after you, usually with the Thief's Ring on. Speaking of rings, I'm gonna put the ring of flame resistance on because this guy's messing me up pretty bad. Just cast poison cloud, back up. It's a very slow way to cheese the fight out, but it is effective if you're not confident about approaching the enemy. And I feel like I should uh my confidence should be diminishing right about now. Skurver, I forgot how fucking scary Skurver is as a black phantom. Which is an, a weird contrast to how he is as a normal NPC, because he's both weak and cowardly. This one, no, he's he's brazen, 
he's coming at me even now that he's out of- Oh no, he wasn't out of mana. He just wanted to get up in close- up close and personal and ignite me. What an asshole. You know, I'm starting to think... Is this Dragon Longsword doing me any good? Because, I mean, if all of his attacks, if he's primarily fire-based, is he more fire-resistant? Because I'm not doing much damage to him at all. And I don't think Skurver should have that much health. Or defense, for that matter. But if he has a high fire resistance, then I'm effectively doing a fraction of the damage I should. Because half of the Dragon Longsword's damage comes from the fire damage. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and try the Dragon Bone Smasher against him. If all else fails, the heavy attack should knock him down. So oh, that was a dangerous whiff. It's the danger of slow weapons that when you whiff with them, you're risking death immediately. Did that do 167? No, he, I think it did, but Skurver just has a lot of health. Way more than I anticipated. I've used so much grass on Skurver, it's ridiculous. I was not expecting resistance from him, let alone this much. Like, I knew he was one of the tougher Black Phantoms, but I had forgotten the extent to which he is a beast. He's actually, I'm pretty sure he's the toughest Black Phantom, come to think of it. I'm gonna knock his ass off the ledge, yeah. And the reason we're fighting Skurver at all, aside from just wanting to do it... Oh, please just drop off and die. Don't just make me fall down there and have to fight you on that narrow ledge. Thank you. We're fighting him for the Talisman of Beasts. So, when he dies like that, you just go ahead and reload the save file. As so, and when you reload... I should say, reload the profile. When you reload your profile, uh, the items will be on his body. Or rather, his body will be there with the items on it, in the spot he spawns. And this is the Talisman of Beasts. Note the description, the symbol of God was nothing more than the image of the Old One. So this is actually an incredibly important item because of that revelation. It's pretty much telling us that the church have been worshipping an idol of the Old One. The talismans are carved in the image of God, or what the Talisman of Beasts reveals to us. Their God is maybe a warped image of the Old One, but it's still the Old One. And it seems to promote the idea that the common ancestry of the soul arts, uh, whether they be for the miracles that the disciples of God, the saints use, or the magicians use, they all descend commonly from the demons and the old one. And that is incredibly important to the lore of this story. So, I decided to finish up this little explanation about the Talisman of Beasts. While something a little bit more relevant is going on. I didn't want to just keep wandering around the cavern down there. So the Talisman of Beasts gameplay significance is that it allows you to cast both spells and miracles without switching between a talisman and a catalyst. Usually... To cast, say, if you had Fireball and Heal equipped, you would need a Catalyst to cast Fireball and a Talisman to cast Heal. With the Talisman of Beasts, you can do that both of those actions with that one item. But its stats, requ its stat requirements are actually too high for me to use. So now that we're here in 1-3 technically the end of 1-2. If you remember uh, back when we did Tower Knight in... That must have been episode 4 or 5? Back when we killed Tower Knight, there was an impenetrable fog blocking us off from, com from entering 1-3. And the requirement to lift that fog was we had to kill a primeval demon. Or an arch... De I'm sorry, not a primeval demon, an arch demon. Which we fulfilled by killing the Dragon God. 
with the Dragon God dead, we could have come here at any point after that. But I chose to uh, not make the Let's Play so top-heavy with Boletaria and Stonefang and branch out into more Shrine of Storms and the Valley of Defilement. And, uh, what am I missing? Latria. God, how do I miss Latria? Latria is amazing. Anyway, let's go ahead and start 1-3. There's a lot of important things going on here. There's no World Tendency events. But what there is, or what there are, are keys. Keys which we will find very, very handy. But let's equip the Thief's Ring because I know there are dogs up in the square ahead. So, do you remember back in 1-2 when I said that there were NPCs or there was an NPC that we just couldn't access yet? There were a lot of things that we didn't have access to because we needed a key. You get the key in this level. In fact, you get two different sets of keys. One key unlocks a door that's in the alleyway just over here. The other set of keys unlocks um, a guard tower that we previously could not access. And it's at the very end of 1-2. So. Each level kind of has a theme for their traps. Five is plague and poison. Vertical pitfalls. Three is pitfalls and prisoner ambushes. Four is cliffside arrow traps. And sky beasts. World 2 had exploding things and lava. World 1-1 had boulders, flaming and otherwise, and dragons. So, what is up here? And while you're thinking that brain buster over, let me just go ahead and rifle through my inventory real quick and make sure I unequip the Stone of Ephemeral Eyes so I don't accidentally waste any, because I already I have a limited supply as is, and I don't need to go wasting the few I have left after that series of suicide runs. If you guessed cannonballs, come collect your gold sticker. Man, the fat officials are assholes. These three guys can be pretty annoying. But... Yeah, and the dragon longsword is pretty damn good. Makes quick work of them. As long as they're not being stubborn and blocking a lot. Okay, so if that looked a little bit weird to you, that's because, hey, it's time for a little bit of post-commentary once again. So, to explain what's going on here, um, the next, uh, I would say like five minutes or so, this entire section, when I recorded it, became a garbled mess. So what I'm showing you now is from when I returned to this area later after backtracking. Because I had significant issues. <clears throat> Basically, I finally pinpointed what was giving me uh, massive amounts of dropped frames. So that that's, I think, fixed for the future. I don't remember if it occurred again while I was recording Demon Souls. I don't think so. So there's supposed to be a boulder up here. It's the one you saw uh, just below me. These are some new enemies, some ninja enemies. Throw, I believe they throw shurikens at you at a range, but they usually flip up close to you and just do uh, long combos. They have a roundhouse kick that breaks your guard and it's pretty nasty. Other than that, they're not too dangerous. Well, you saw me get surrounded by them there and they still didn't manage to prove to be that much of a challenge. So, what I decided to do to get around the fact that I have about five minutes of literally unwatchable footage is to just insert this little clip of when I backtrack through a year later and do this little post-commentary section explaining that. So in the building here on my right, through that door, you could just barely see the glimmer of uh, red eyes. There's a red eye snipe behind there. 
along with a few draggling reinforcements. A little ambush. It's not wise to approach him right away anyway, because you have a brigade of crossbowmen waiting for you on the other side who will attack you across the gap while you fight the Red Eyes Knight. So what you want to do is head through here, take out the Greatsword Blue-Eyed Knight, take out the crossbowmen, and then if you still want to go back to that other section where the Red Eye is, uh, you're free to draw him out onto the, the battlement and fight him in a more open area. And once you clear his room out, you get access to the Dregling Merchant. You can buy, I think, a Night Shield from him. I'm not entirely certain about that, I don't remember. There is also um, one thing that you're not seeing here, is that there's usually a Fat Official here. And the Fat Official is the one who holds the key ring that unlocks Bior's cell. And I think around the time that I get to Bior's cell, there's going to be a little bit of fast forwarding in a moment too. Around the time that I get to be your cell is when I will stop the post commentary and let the normal commentary track kick back in because that's when the footage becomes good again because I didn't catch on to there being an issue for a little bit. And so what I'll do is uh, I won't show all of this again um, when I get back to this point to the point where I need to start coming back here. Uh, I guess I'll just fast forward or cut that out and cut back to this area right here. So it's not too disorienting. Again, apologies for uh, some janky editing workarounds, but best I can do with the, uh, the way the footage turned out, unfortunately. Should be mm, as close to seamless as possible, but no guarantees there. Either way, um, the reason that I wanted to show this is just to make sure that I've showed off all of the areas of, uh, this section of Bulletarian Palace. So, I'm gonna go ahead and fast forward. So, the reason a while back I said that Made in Astraya, or the Maiden Astraya, the Sixth Saint Astraya turning her back to the church because of a certain revelation would make sense in time was exactly because of the Talisman of Beasts, and I can't remember why I didn't work that into this into the description earlier, but hey, post-commentary rectification. Rectification sounds like something to do with anal. Anyway, returning to the normal commentary track in 3, 2, 1-ish. So, now that the Blue Eyes Knights are cleared out, literally at the end of 1-2, you find the, uh, the guard tower leading down to Bior. And a fat official who guards another set of keys, which we need, which we will need shortly. So where, where is he? There you are. Man, I feel like my voice just cracked again. What the fuck? Every time I record, I go through puberty. I think this is the first I think this is the first fat official we've seen using the Crescent Great Axe. Man, every time I try to get close to him, he slices me with the axe. He's actually a really quick attack. Some of them, like, yeah, the overhead is not that swift or anything. There was one, though, he was just punishing me for the wind-up on mine. Jesus. I think some of these cells just can... Just contains stones. Maybe stone of ephemeral eyes? No, just a soul. I was wrong about that. That bad official has the bloody iron keys, or the bloody ring of keys. Curse my short term memory loss. There's Bior. Not gonna talk to him just yet. The bloody keys are used to unlock the uh, alleyway gate that leads to Yuria, which will do. Just momentary, momentarily. I am grateful that this comes at the very end of 1-2 if you have to get the key from 1-3. Because at least it makes the backtracking trek a little less intense, a little less tedious. <laughs> Who goes there? Uh, you killed that vile insect and saved me. <laughs> I am called Bior, the elder of the twin fangs of Boletaria. I thank you. You deserve a handsome reward. 
Only I have none. <laughs> Go on ahead. I shall sleep a while. And that is the mighty and awesome Bjor. He has no additional dialogue for us because he's fallen asleep. Don't you love Bjor? I'm not I'm not being sarcastic either. Bjor's fucking awesome. If you can just be imprisoned like this, likely tortured by the fat officials, and go, oh, someone rescued me. You know what all that torture really takes it out of a guy? I'm gonna have a nice nap here in my cell. Bjor is the boss of all bosses. Also, I will something about him makes me feel bad that he actually offered me a reward for saving him. <laughs> I totally deserve it, but I mean, I wouldn't want to take a reward from Bjor. He's just so likable. He's like he's like Santa if Santa was a dark fantasy knight. This jolly laughter in his swaying belly. Man is rotund. Fortunately, though, we have to leave Bior behind for just a little bit. I have I, I have a feeling that we're going to be see him, seeing him again shortly. Like, maybe during a certain boss fight that's coming up in the next episode. I think I've layered on the foreshadowing a little too thick there. Oh, man, I can't wait to fight alongside Bior since I've already spoiled that. It's not really a spoiler. It's more like... Look forward to something awesome. It's a teaser. Teasers. They're actually spoilers in fucking disguise. Let's let's be frank about that. Anyway, I'm going to go and figure out what I'm going to do about the garbled footage I found in the preview screen. Thanks for watching, guys. Take it easy. Have a good one.